Okay, so we're gonna start like we always start, a little bit of a review of the anatomy and phys. So talking about orthopedic, orthopedics being relation to bone and in particular with this chapter, fractures and different types of fractures. But that said, we still gotta go through the, the baseline, okay? So our muscles, they help give us form, they help give us an upright posture, right? Everything that we have muscle-wise, at least external muscle-wise, somatic muscle-wise, helps give our body shape. By each one of those muscles contracting, it pulls us straight up, okay? And then our muscles obviously allow for movement uh, between flexion and extension, just obviously depending on what we're doing, right? Flex uh, flexion being bringing closer to the body, extension bringing it away. Do you guys remember what it's called? Uh, if I was to bring my arms together in the middle, do you remember what that's called? Adduction. Adduction. What if I take them apart? Adduction. There you go. Very good. And then, like I told you guys, with our bones, similar to our muscles, think of them as armor. Think of our muscles as the protective armor for our bones, our bones the protective armor for our organs, but both of which do work for our organs, obviously. So bones, muscles, tendons, cartilage, ligaments are still at risk, even though they are, uh, excuse me, yeah, protecting and defending the internal organs, you can still obviously injure the external armor. So musculoskeletal injuries, among the most common reasons why patients seek medical attention. You will see these all sorts of varieties, all sorts of reasons for why they happened, um, all sorts of demographics involved as well. And we'll talk about different fracture types a little bit later through this. Uh, and these different fracture types tend to apply to uh, different demographics. Some of them, some of them are more specific to like children or one in particular, one is more specific to, tends to be older people. But like I said, we'll talk about it. Okay, um, so if someone breaks something, it's usually pretty easy to tell, right? Um, either one, the pain reaction, Two, if it starts to swell up really large. And three, people hold things that are broken and hurt, right? That's just instinct. You guys should have seen that by now in your life, okay? And then obviously, if it's deformed, you've been people long enough to know what a normal arm looks like. So if an arm is shooting off at a 90 degree, the forearm, that's wrong, okay? And then you can have some short or long-term disability depending on the severity of the fracture and then depending on where it is, okay? So not everybody gets out of a... Uh, a broken bone scot-free. Sometimes there are lingering deficits. So three types of muscle cells. Once again, we have cardiac, skeletal, and smooth. Can someone tell me where our smooth muscle tends to be? Arteries. Intestines, arteries is another good one, yeah. Um, do we control smooth muscle? So what kind of muscle is it? There you go. Same thing with cardiac muscle. Is that voluntary or involuntary? Very good. And we'll talk about that in a second here, but the cardiac muscles are kind of their own special muscle, right? They are involuntary, but they have a very specific function. So they're a little specialized and we'll talk about it. And then we have our skeletal muscle, otherwise known as somatic muscle, otherwise known as striated muscle. If you hear striated, somatic, or skeletal, they all mean the same thing. Okay, yeah, Sam. No, so um, they're similar in, in the fact that we don't control them. But smooth muscle versus cardiac muscle, the, the big differentiator is the uh, electrical activity. Cardiac tissue is a lot more conductive because our heart fires through electrical impulse versus our smooth muscles that kind of just kind of move their way along, right? There's no like set time frame they have to be moving with. So that's the big difference. Okay, so skeletal muscle attaches to the bones, usually crosses at least one joint. If it did not cross the joint, that would not cause any movement, right? If we have the muscles going across the joint, that's what pulls our foot up. If we look at like, well, this is the calf, but the hamstring, right? The hamstring, the back of your leg goes down behind the knee and attaches down lower. That's why when we bend our, our leg or we flex our hamstring, it pulls our leg up. It's all crisscrossing the joints. That's allowing for our motion, 
right? And then we have muscles on the opposite end that do the exact opposite action, right? We have quads versus hamstrings. When quads extend, our legs extend. Or when our quads flex, our legs extend, right? Hamstrings flex, our legs curl up, right? We always have that balance. So voluntary muscle, and then they make up the largest portions of the body's muscle mass. It's all gonna be our skeletal muscle. Um, oh, and then backtracking to smooth. Does anyone remember what it's called when smooth muscle starts to squeeze things forward? Do you remember what that's called or know what that's called? It's called peristalsis. Peristalsis is like when the uh, intestines have stuff in them, like say they're moving stool along, and the intestines just kind of squeeze their way forward. And as they squeeze close, it just kind of pushes that stool down the road. Okay, so just a different type of contraction. <clears throat> so skeletal muscle are supplied with arteries, veins, nerves, just like the rest of every other muscle, every other cell in our body, right? They're no different. Skeletal t muscle tissue is directly attached to bones by tendons. Okay, so muscles attached to bones via tendons and muscles connect to muscles via ligaments. Or excuse me, I got, that, I got that backwards. Bone connected to bone is ligaments, muscle to bone is tendons, okay? The ligaments are what hold our bones together. Um, pretty common example, if you guys think of sports injury, like the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, that's gonna be the ligament in the front of your knee that connects your knee bones together. So when people tear that, their knee bones are starting to separate. Okay, so ligaments are bone to bone, tendons are muscle to bone. And then smooth muscle, right? So a lot of the automatic work, we know that it is involuntary, okay? And then this is, if this is gonna be the intestine, as it squeezes, this is going to be moving everything forward. That's that peristalsis. Peristalsis moves things through tubes, okay? And then just future reference, if you see a hole in any tissues, like if we were to, if this is a, with a vein or an artery and we cut it like this, anytime there's a hole in the middle, that's the lumen of that, okay? Lumen just means central hole. Um, we went over, I know it might've been quick, but the layers of vasculature, right? Okay, just wanted to make sure. And then cardiac muscle specifically adapted, right? Because it has to regulate itself and by regulating itself, what that really means is that it is in charge of conducting its own electrical impulses to keep itself firing, okay? So it's a very specialized type of cell. We could go into a lot more depth with it, but you don't need to, okay? It's a bare ma that's kind of just what you need to know. So moving away from the muscles, we're gonna move into the skeleton. Gives us recognizable form, protects our organs, allows us to move, right? A lot of similar functions to muscles. Um, you have approximately 206 bones in the body. They say approximately because some people have extra bones. Some people are missing bones. Uh, I know a person who has an extra vertebrae in his lower back. I also have a niece that is missing one of her nasal bones. So it's kind of approximate. 206 is the usual answer. Okay. Um, produces blood cells. So our bone marrow, big function of our bone marrow is red blood cell production. Um, it actually ties in pretty deeply with our vasculature to the point where above your guys' scope in situations where we need to get access, instead of doing an IV and going into a vein, say the veins are no good, we will actually drill straight into bone and we'll push fluids and medications through that. It's called an intraosseous access. And then our bones also serve as a reservoir for minerals and electrolytes. Any guesses on what the big mineral is that we store in our bones? Calcium, right? Calcium's for strong bones and teeth. Drink milk, right? We've all heard that. <clears throat> but yeah, it stores calcium for us. That's the skeleton. Upper extremity, lower extremity, pelvis, shoulder girdle. <coughs> okay, so the skull. Once again, it's the helmet, right? It protects our brain. We have our thoracic cage, otherwise known as our rib cage, right? Thoracic cage, rib cage, you need to know both terms, both terms meaning the same thing. But regardless, that thoracic cage protects heart, lungs, great vessels, esophagus, airway, right? A lot of really big, important, necessary to life structures. 
So our rib cage is a pretty important set of bones, right? And then we have our pectoral girdle, consists of the two scapula and your two clavicles, your collarbone and your shoulder blade help to form the sockets that make your shoulder. Okay, they also have the attachment points that make your, uh, your rotator cuffs, okay, and that those muscles in the shoulder help to hold everything together. So it's a very um, codependent relationship between the muscles and the bones when it comes to joints. Okay. <clears throat> So we have the clavicle, we have the uh, scapula on the back there. These feel like words you guys know by now? Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Okay, so upper extremity, shoulder, fingertips, right? Upper arm bone being the humerus, funniest bone in the body. <laughs> um, pretty proud of that one. It's okay, no one else has to laugh. Uh, so compose the upper arm is the humerus, then we have the uh, radius and ulna down in the arm, lower arm, what side is our radius on? Thumb side, right? It's important to know which one's the radius was and which one's the ulna because we find radial pulses, right? So you wanna know where the radius is. It's always thumb side. Very good. Hands, three sets of bones, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. Carpals being the wrist, metacarpals being the hand itself, and phalanges being the fingers. Okay, I'm just gonna kind of fly through this so we can get to the good stuff. Uh, pelvis supports the body weight, protects structures within the pelvis. So the bladder, the rectum, uh, and females reproductive organs sit in the pelvis. Okay, we also can lose a decent amount of blood from our pelvis. Do you guys remember how much we can lose in our pelvis if it fractures? Yeah, two, yeah, one and a half to two liters of blood. Versus our femurs, how many can we lose per femur? one per femur, right? So one, one, and if we broke all three there, we could lose up to four liters of blood. Do you guys remember what the average amount of blood a person has is? Five to six, right? So if you lose four, I'm not good at math, but that math don't add up good, right? Okay, so pelvic girdle formed by the ischium, ilium, and pubis. Ilium being at the top here, ischium being at the back, and pubis being the front, okay? And then the bones are fused, right? We don't have free floating bones in our pelvis. Everything is kind of stuck together. It gives us rigidity, gives us more structure. The lower extremity, femur being the biggest bone in our body, okay? Someone breaks a femur, it's gonna take a decent amount of force. The mechanism's gonna be intense. So if we see one, we gotta act on it, okay? Below the femur, well, we have the femoral head, which is also just something, an important distinction. That's gonna be the top here. The reason that femoral head is important where it attaches to the hip is because it helps to form our hip joint. But more importantly than that, it tends to be the bone that people break when they break their hip. It's very common for especially older, uh, in my experience, older gals, when they fall down, not uncommon for them to break that head of the femur off. Okay, and that can be just another version of a broken hip. Okay, because it's all, once again, forming that hip joint. And then down in the leg, we have the uh, tib yeah, excuse me, tibia and fibula. Tibia being more anterior, forming our shin, fibula being the small bone on the lateral side. And then we have our patella, or the kneecap. And that just kind of floats over there. It's held in place by uh, two ligaments. Okay, you have your patellar ligaments, patellar tendons as well. And then our foot, similar to the hand, set of carpals, it's tarsals. So ankle bones are tarsals, foot bones are metatarsals, phalanges are the toes. Okay, so carpals, metacarpals, phalanges, tarsals, metatarsals, phalanges. Okay, and then the skeleton provides framework to which muscles and tendons are attached. Uh, you can go into a lot of depth and you can learn a whole lot about these attachment points. We won't be doing that in this class. Different fields do focus on that a little bit more. Um, for example, like massage therapists, they are very in tune with your attachment points. Uh, my sister-in-law is a massage therapist. She was telling me about her schooling and basically they gave them clay and a skeleton and said, form the muscles. Okay, so they're very familiar. That's just not something we need to know as deep, okay? 
and then joints. Joints is when two bones meet together and that's kind of that middle zone, right? So your joint, each one of your joints has a capsule around it, a fibrous capsule, it's called a bursa. And you can actually have injuries in that bursa itself, but the bursa is just kind of like the, it's a sac that holds everything together. And then within that bursa, you have fluid. And that synovial, it's synovial fluid, but that synovial fluid is a lubricant. It just, think of it as the oil in your hinge, right? That's exactly what it's doing for your joints. And they all allow for motion. Um, yeah, there, I know a couple of people that have gotten bursitis pretty bad in their elbows and in their shoulders. And just that capsule gets inflamed and it gets a lot of fluid in there and it's, it's a mess, it's kind of gross. Okay, so any questions on that anatomy review? It's just a quick one. Okay, so when we talk about mechanism, right, we gotta pay attention to what the mechanism is because if the mechanism is great enough, not only are our bones and muscles being impacted, but also our organs, right? Now, different types, you have direct blows, indirect blows, there's twisting forces, and then there's high energy. Right? Now there's all sorts of different trauma out there, but these are kind of the generalized four. Getting hit directly, indirectly, twisting, or high energy. And depending on the type of mechanism will dictate the type of fracture you can end up with. Okay? So a fracture. A fracture is a broken bone. There's no difference between a broken bone and a fracture. When you hear people say, oh, thankfully it's only fractured, it's not broken. It is broken. They're the same thing. Okay? Now we classify fractures as either open or closed, right? And a closed fracture is when that skin is still intact. An open fracture is when the skin is broken and the contents of the inside of our body are seeing the outside world for the first time, which is not their ideal choice, okay? So it's all based on that skin being opened or closed. You can have some pretty deformed bones that are closed fractures still. Right, if we think back to that picture of my friend who broke his skull, right, that's technically a closed fracture. It's a skull fracture, but it was closed because he had that skin covering it, right? I showed that to you, right? Yeah, okay. Whew, don't scare me like that. It's my favorite, favorite picture. Okay, so fractures described by whether the bone is moved from its normal position or not. When we're talking about the movement of the bone, we're talking about a displaced or a non-displaced fracture. Okay, so a non-displaced fracture is like a crack in the bone. Okay, it's not forcing any deformity, any major deformity. It is a, basically their arm looks about as normal as it can. They just have a crack in there. Whether it's complete or incomplete, it still looks fairly normal. Versus a displaced fracture, that's the one when you're thinking like lightning bolting their arms or they start, you know, they give themselves a second elbow or a second knee down a little lower than normal. That's a displace. So these are just a couple of the fractures we'll talk about. These are pictures of them, okay? So that first one is gonna be a green stick fracture, kind of peeling apart. Does anyone know, have any guesses on what demographic deals with green stick fractures or which one is more susceptible? Think about what a green stick, right? If we were to pull a branch off of a tree and start to try and break it, if it's a dry branch, it breaks. If it's a green branch, it kind of peels, right? It doesn't, all the way, it doesn't peel itself all the way apart, but it peels down into the middle, right? So which demographic of people do you think are more likely for green sticks? Younger, Younger pediatrics, yeah, kids. Green sticks are very, very common in kids because they have the, the softer bones, they're more malleable. The next one is an oblique fracture. And we'll talk about each one of these in a little bit more de uh, depth, but oblique fractures come in at an angle, okay? C is a pathologic fracture, so that's not so much, that picture right there is more of the bone, what the bone looks like before the fracture or associated with, because that's a diseased, excuse me, a diseased portion of bone. And then the last one's an incomplete fracture. It's not totally broken all the way through, it's just cracked about halfway in. Okay, and we'll talk about each one of these. These are just the pictures I want you guys to pay some attention to. Okay, so different types of fractures. We have your comminuted fracture. 
Okay, so a fracture in the bone in which the bone is broken into more than two fragments. Right, if we break it down the middle, that's two fragments. Think of it almost like if we flail chest, if we have that broken segment of bone. Or if the bone breaks in such a way that we have like chips and pieces in there as well. Then we have epiphyseal. An epiphyseal fracture is the type of fracture that uh, impacts children or growing people, rather. I guess children are growing people, whatever. But it's a break in their growth plate. So if they fracture through that, it can actually disrupt the bone's growth. And this is where I'm saying they can end up with deficits. Has anyone seen people on the internet that have like that one short leg that's got a really tall rubber, uh, rubber sole? Those people tend to be, I'm not gonna speak for all of them, but the ones that I've seen, I have the ones I've done some digging into, um, they broke growth plates when they were kids. And their leg just stopped growing at the same rate of development. And that's why they have a shorter leg. And then a green stick, incomplete fracture that passes only partway through the shaft of a bone. And remember with green stick, pediatric, right, and that their bones don't necessarily break as easy, they bend before they break. Adult bones break, kids bones bend, then break. Okay, important distinction. We have incomplete fractures, so a fracture that does not run completely through the bone, right, they break about halfway through. An oblique fracture is going to be the one that's at the angle, like I said earlier, and a pathologic fracture is a weakened portion of bone because of some sort of disease, whether that be like osteoporosis, uh, osteochondritis, all sorts of different conditions can lead to pathologic fractures. It's just weakening of bone, right? It's the same thing if we think about like the structure of a building, like imagine an old brick building Okay, and then like the side of it, one corner, let's say, is starting to erode away because of the water, right? That's probably the portion that's gonna break first on that building. Same thing with our bones. If you weaken it down with disease, it's probably, or it's, excuse me, it's at a higher chance or likelihood of fracture. Then we have uh, spiral fractures. Spiral fractures are associated with twisting motions, okay? And that's the type of fracture that spins around the bone on the way up. Okay, so twisting force caused by an oblique fracture around and through the bone. Spiral fractures can wrap up around the bone. Uh, this is a common one seen in kids too, when like parents grab their arm and they're like, come on, let's go. And they twist the kid's arm as they're lifting them up off the ground. I just threw my balance off. Let's say, but they lift the kid up, you know, and they twist. That's a common way. Um, I have a buddy who broke his leg when we were in like seventh or eighth grade. Um, and he got a spiral fracture up his tibia. And his leg was planted, we were playing backyard football. Kid jumped on him while his leg was in a weird spot and it just twisted and broke it. And then we have the last, well, yeah, one of the last ones, transverse straight across a bone. That is just a through and through straight line fracture. Okay, transverse. Where's our transverse plane? Do you guys remember that? Let's throw it back a little bit. Yeah. Cutting top and bottom, right? Right in the middle. Same thing with the transverse, straight through the middle, okay? So, ways to suspect a fracture. One, just look at that. This, if you've been a person, you should look at this and be like, well, that don't look right, right? That should, that should look a little off. So deformity, that's a big one for us. Tenderness, guarding, and swelling are also there. If we look at this bottom picture, right? Which of these two knees is swollen? They're right, right? The one on our left, the patient's right. Yeah, there's something going on in there, right? So swelling doesn't just happen for no reason. Swelling can happen for all sorts of reasons, but in traumatic injury, if you see something swollen in a traumatic mechanism, more than likely we're leaning into fracture. And then guarding, um, just to go into it a little bit, when people hurt themselves, and I'm sure you've all done this to some extent at least once in your life, if you hurt yourself, you grab onto that area and you really don't want people touching it, you don't want people looking at it, right? That's guarding, and guarding happens all over the body. It's not specific for fractures. When people have abdominal pain too, right, they guard their stomach like that. If you go to touch them, they kind of flex up a little bit, right, that's the same idea. Guarding is just protecting your injuries. Uh, we also could look for, well, there's a good analogy or a good acronym 
no, that's not the word, mnemonic, that's the word, that we use when we're, we can look at fractures. Any guesses on what that is? That'll tell us if it might be fractured? Things we're looking for during? DCAP BTLS, yeah, right? I mean, bruising crepitus, those are already, well, crepitus isn't in there, should be, but bruising crepitus, right? Those are DCAP BTLS things that we are looking for. So with fractures, bruising crepitus, false motion. Does anyone know what false motion is or any guesses? Think about uh, if anyone's ever seen the videos that I'm thinking, the UFC videos where people are like kicking at people and then they break their shin and then their toes wrap around and touch their knee on the same leg, right? That's false motion. It's motion that's coming from somewhere that should not be moving, right? So if we break, if I break my arm right here and I do this and then my arm just starts wagging right there, all right, that's false motion, that's bad. Um, obviously exposed bone, pain can be associated, and then a locked up joint. Depending on where the fracture is, if say they break right here, right by the elbow, right, that joint is gonna become basically useless to them. Right, it starts to lock up. Same with shoulders, they do the same thing. Okay, so we have fractures and we have dislocations. A dislocation, uh, I wanna give you the actual definition. Uh, disruption of a joint in which the bone ends are no longer in contact, right? You guys have all, I'm assuming, heard of like a dislocated shoulder, right? That, that ball comes out of the socket. You can have dislocations all over, knees, ankles, shoulders, wrists, elbows, um, hips dislocate as well. Now with dislocations, do you think that we ever put them back? No. We do not reduce a dislocation. We do not force them back into their socket, okay? There's only one dislocation that we can deal with. It's an ALS skill. I don't know if advanced EMTs can do it. I know medics for sure can, but it's lateral kneecap. So if the kneecap slides down to the side, um, we can reduce those. Reason being is that they're fairly simple to reduce. If someone's kneecap dislocates, and it slides to that lateral side, it just bends their leg down here and they can't straighten it. So their kneecap's just chilling on the side of their leg. So all you do is you put pressure, whoop, put pressure down on there, start sliding it as they extend their leg and then it pops back into place. Nine times out of 10, it's actually a refusal. Um, most of those don't end up going. And the thing with dislocations too is that a lot of people who have a history of dislocation are gonna dislocate it again, okay? Um, those ligaments are never the same after. Uh, for anybody who's ever like sprained an ankle, sprained their wrist, right? You've probably repeatedly sprained that same extremity over and over. Similar idea. The ligaments and the tendons are just getting too weak, okay? And they're getting stretched out, so you're at a higher likelihood. Um, and people who, in my experience, people who have had several dislocations of the same uh, extremity, tend to be pretty familiar with the process and a lot of times they don't really want much from you outside of a ride. Uh, the last guy that I, I ran a dislocation on was downtown. He said that he had dislocated that shoulder, I think he said upwards of 20 times in his life, and he was reaching for his doorknob and it just fell out, right? It doesn't take a whole lot if you've done it enough times, okay? <clears throat> now, big reason why we don't reduce things is that one, we don't know, we can't x-ray through, we don't know what structures are underlying, right? If something got pulled, say an artery or vein got pulled into a weird spot with that dislocation and we snap it back, we could corrupt uh, vasculature, we could do, we don't know if there's any fractures associated, right? Say someone dislocates their elbow and it's hanging to the side and we try to reduce it but they have a fracture in here and we force it back. Well, we may have just displaced this fracture now, right? So we just don't reduce things just to be on the safe side because we can make stuff worse, okay? <clears throat> so, signs and symptoms of dislocations, marked deformity, swelling, pain, that's definitely worse when they try to move, tenderness on palpation, meaning when we touch them, uh, the joint motion is impacted, and then depending on the severity, excuse me, depending on the severity, they could have circulation pro uh, problems. So, what can we do to assess for circulation problems. Cap refill is an example. Yeah, we could use cap refill. 
There's better ones though. Three letters. And you do it before and after you splint stuff. CMS, PMS, right? Circulation, motor, sensory. You can check all of those on uh, dislocations, right? It's because more than likely, depending on the dislocation, you're going to be splinting them to some extent. So you're going to have to do that anyway. Do not forget CMS, PMS. It is important. It's important because it gives us a baseline, right? If we have a baseline, OK, at baseline, I know they have a pulse in that wrist. I'm going to splint it. And then we check after we splint it and that pulse is gone. We made that mistake, right? That's on us. We know that we can change and fix it. Same thing with dislocations. So a sprain. A sprain is when the joint's twisted or stretched beyond its normal range of motion, okay? You're gonna be disrupting ligaments and tendons usually with a sprain. A lot of time it's gonna be the tendons, you're just overstretching them, right? It's kind of the, mm, I don't wanna say necessarily. It's, it's similar to, I guess, a dislocation in the, to the sense of like, it's the preemptive to a dislocation. You're starting to weaken that joint, weaken those ligaments, weaken the tendons, and by doing that, the whole joint starts to become compromised and you put yourself at risk. That said, just because you have a sprain does not mean you're gonna be dislocating something anytime soon. Okay, like I said, it's a slow burn. It's gonna take a while to get there. Now, sprains can range from mild to severe. I'm assuming you've all had a sprain of some sort, and if you haven't, what's it like to be God's favorite? Um, <laughs> the most vulnerable joints for sprains, knees, shoulders, and ankles, and then severe deformity usually does not happen. However, with sprains, they will get super, super swollen, and the bruising will start to show up. So there may not be like a, a deformity per se with like the bone itself, but if you were to look at it, your instincts should know by now that don't look right, okay? And they usually swell up pretty big and get pretty purple. Right this. So guarding, swelling, and ecchymosis. What does ecchymosis mean again? Hmm? Yeah. So discoloration is the pooling of blood, though, more specifically. As that blood pools into that area, that's what gives it that dark color. Okay, and then pain, and then instability in the joint, also associated with sprains. Comments, questions, concerns on sprains, or anything so far? Okay. And then we have strains. So strains is like a pole, you know, and that's another one of those, like, I didn't fracture, or, you know, thankfully it's fractured, not broken. Thankfully it's just strained, not pulled. It's the same thing. A strained muscle is a pulled muscle, okay? Pain, swelling, bruising of the soft tissue in the area, they're definitely gonna be feeling it. They are gonna possibly have, depending on what they pull or what they strain, um, some impact on their movement as well, okay? And then often no deformity present. There may be some minor swelling, but even then, dependent, okay? Okay, amputations. Amputation is an injury in which an extremity is completely severed from the body and it can damage every aspect of the musculoskeletal system, depending on where the amputation is. Um, we don't amputate. That is not something we do commonly. I know one person who amputated in the field, which I'm pretty sure I told you about that guy, right? Um, not a common thing but it is something you may have to run into injury-wise. Uh, a good friend of mine at Ada County, he uh, ran a call, I wanna say March, right in March or early or in February. Guy was riding his motorcycle on, uh, from Garden City, heading north on Glenwood. So he was going up that hill and he ended up crashing his motorcycle into the barrier and it ripped his leg off. Okay, so you, you will see these from time to time. Um, when you're treating them, Make sure you take the amputated portion with you because they could still reattach it, just depending. Um, when that guy got his leg ripped off, it was not funny, but it was kind of funny. You hear over the radio, uh, the supervisor comes on and says, hey, tell that police officer to grab the leg. And then it's like, oh, okay, they forgot something important, right? Um, and then that police officer's driving code with just this random dude's leg in the back seat of his car. Wild times. Okay, so complications with orthopedic injuries. There are a few, okay? So can lead to systemic changes or illnesses. Um, think about 
anytime we have an injury, an open injury to the outside world, we at our, excuse me, we are at risk for infection. Okay, same thing, you have a broken bone, that bone piece is at risk for infection. Granted, it's not gonna have a ton of exposure, or it shouldn't have a ton of exposure, but if it's an open fracture, right, and that bone seeing outside world, that's a massive infection risk to not only the skin or the system, but that bone as well, okay? So likelihood of having complications is related to the strength of the force, where they got hit, and then your overall health beforehand. People who keep themselves healthy tend to recover from these type of things fairly well, okay? The people who do not keep themselves healthy and they get a fracture, that fracture can change their life significantly um, in a bad way, okay? Say someone's already fairly, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, sedentary, right? They're not someone who's super active on their own and then they fall and they break their hip well, now they have even more reason not to become active, right? And it's just a kind of a compounding issue and it becomes a cycle because now they can no longer get out of their chair even if they wanted to and they start, in my experience, they start to roll into that a little bit. So open fractures for contamination. If they have stuff on there like a powder or dirt, brush it off, get all that debris off of there, okay? Don't ever go poking into the fracture site. And then long-term disability is one of the most devastating consequences of an orthopedic injury. You know, like, like I kind of said with those uh, epiphyseal fractures, when people break their growth plate, right, that's a long-term um, deficit related to a fracture, right, that changed that person's life for long-term. Okay, um, a lot of times, like I said, it's, it's kind of hard to explain until you've seen it but that vicious cycle of you know, seeing people dislocate or break a hip, and then when they're coming back, trying to get their balance falling and breaking something else, and it's just an over and over and over, it becomes a vicious, vicious cycle after a little bit. Okay, so we can reduce the risk of long-term disability though. We can stop further injury. How do we prevent an injury from getting worse? What can we do? Splint it, right? We put it together as best we can, hold it in place, give them a better chance for it. Um, we can get rid of, or we can reduce the risk of wound infection, right? We can brush off the areas. We can use saline to irrigate away if we have to, um, you know, clean them up a little bit. Uh, you can use cold and pain control to help because pain control, no one's ever died from pain, but pain has, or getting rid of pain makes it so that they are not fidgeting, I guess, as much with it, right? If something doesn't hurt, they usually leave it still. Okay, and then also making sure they're going to the correct facility. And when they're talking about correct facility in the trauma realm, they're talking about a trauma center. Okay, if they have a trauma center near them, that's where they need to go, okay? Okay, so the golden hour. Critical for life and for preserving limb viability. The golden hour is basically the time frame you have from the time that was injured, whatever extremity or whatever was injured, um, time they actually hurt themselves to when we get them to definitive care, within that first hour, that's usually their best shot, especially if it's like an amputation, uh, reattaching things like that, it's their best shot for making sure the bones are not in the healing process already. Um, some bones, if you fracture them and they start to heal, it can make setting them or resetting them a lot harder. Um, when I was a kid, I broke my nose, I got kicked in the face, and I didn't go get to the doctor. I think it was for like two weeks, and my, but my nose had already started to fuse itself back shut. So they had to re-break my nose just to put it back in place. Okay, it's not an uncommon thing for bones to start healing up too soon. So we wanna get them there, we'll get them the best chance for you know no more deficit, or at least lower their odds of deficit or a life-changing uh, infection. And most injuries are also not going to be critical, okay? That's something that's kind of hard to delineate when you're out there, especially when you see somebody in pain, especially when you see someone who's in pain and on top of that, you know, they've got like an angulated uh, ankle. That happened to me, one of my first really bad traumatic calls, a guy was playing soccer, a refugee guy, broke his ankle in a good 90 degree and every instinct I, I had was like, we gotta drive fast, we gotta go. 
And my training officer was like, why? Is he his life under any threat? I'm like, no, he's probably uncomfortable and it hurts though. And he's like, yeah, but has pain ever killed anybody? Not really, right? There's also, you guys will learn when you get out there that driving code, light sirens, or even using the Opticom, which just changes the street lights, can disrupt traffic for a long time and it can end up biting you in the butt on your return to things. Um, we've all experienced it to some degree out there. Okay, so for the most part, they're non-critical. It's when they start impacting vital signs, when they start impacting uh, appearance of that patient, right, that we're starting to get concerned. Okay, so assessment, look at the big picture. Tough thing with orthopedic injuries as well is that they tend to be visually jarring. And what I mean by that is they're distracting, right? If someone breaks their ankle at a 90 degree turn, you're gonna be looking at that because that's gonna be the weirdest looking thing on them, right? But you gotta look past that. You gotta keep the whole picture in mind because sometimes, well, actually if we backtrack to this, right? Most injuries are non-critical the ones that look the gnarliest tend not to be life threats. Okay, so we gotta look past that. We gotta make sure we're not missing something. If they got hit hard enough, and that's reading the mechanism, right? If they got hit hard enough to break their femur, or they got hit hard enough to 90 degree a leg, let's check the femur, let's check the hips, right? There could be more things involved here that could do more damage, or excuse me, they could have a higher impact on the quality of life of that patient. So, scene size up, not a lot changes there. Pay attention to your surroundings, okay? Indicators of the mechanism. Primary, a lot of times it's gonna be life threat, or not a lot of times, every time with the primary we're looking for life threats. So, if we have just a, a orthopedic fracture, right? That's not gonna be deemed a life threat most of the time. That's something we can take care of during the secondary. Now, if you have time, it's not a life-threatening injury, Patients and you know their pain's relatively controlled. They're being uh, cooperative. You can splint things on scene. That's totally acceptable. Just make sure you're not missing something. Okay, it's when we take the time to splint a broken arm and they have a broken pelvis that we run into problems, right? Because we got bigger fish to fry. Make sense? Okay. Um, be prepared to treat for shock, so lay them flat, blanket, oxygen, assess ABCs like always. Circulation, so anytime we're talking orthopedic injury, you have to get that CMS checked, okay? Always, always, always. And the reason is, is deeper than just this class or even beyond this class, is that different trauma centers, or for example, different priority traumas like St. Owls, um, they have a priority three, two, and one. And the loss of circulation in a broken or injured extremity actually qualifies them. I think it upgrades them from a priority three to a priority two. Reason being is that they're gonna to need to have a surgeon in the room. That's the difference with these trauma priorities. Each, each priority level gets more and more people in that room. Okay, so P1, that's like, um, during my, my clinical time, a guy crashed his motorcycle, ripped his leg off also. Um, when they got into the room, flight brought them in. There was like three surgeons, just a slew of nurses, two doctors. Okay, there's a lot of people in there versus if I bring a P3 in, it's maybe a doctor and two nurses, right? So it just depends on the severity. So you have to check that circulation. And then transport decision, right? Most of the time they're non-critical. Just make sure you're not missing something. Uh, history. Do the best you can. It might correlate with the orthopedic, right? If we're talking maybe older folks and they have like a history of something like osteoporosis where they have weaker bones, that's definitely pertinent information. That's information that makes a difference with this call, right? It implies that, okay, maybe she fractured be or they fractured because of a weakened bone. But outside of that, history and trauma don't tend to play together, okay? There's usually not a ton of correlation to their past medical history and trauma because tend it tends to be a lot more acute. So the secondary, DCAP BTLS, this is when we're gonna do either that systematic head to toe or a rapid um, focused assessment, right? So if we are scared we're missing something, we'll start at the head, work our way down. If they're unconscious, we're gonna be cutting clothes down to their skivvies and they will be trauma naked, okay? Uh, you want to be able to visualize everything. That way you don't, want, you don't miss anything. 
versus, and that's if they're unconscious, it's severe, right? Versus if they have a broken arm and that's the only thing going on, we have time, let's just focus on that one arm, okay? And you can always splint uh, injuries in the back of the ambulance, right? If you guys think you need to splint a broken arm, but they're you know unconscious or their blood pressure is dropping or whatever, complaint is starting to throw you sideways, you can always just move them to the ambulance. You still got time and you still have hands. You can always bring people with you in the back of the ambulance, okay? And they can help you splint. Uh, reassess, five for unstable, 15 for stable, XABCs. Uh, 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 and then document everything. Okay, so our care of orthopedic injuries, pretty simple, straightforward, it's splinting, right? Now I say simple and straightforward, there's a thousand and one ways to splint things. It's really dependent on the equipment you have, okay, it's dependent on your agency, but regardless, splinting is our answer for orthopedic injuries, okay? By splinting them, potentially, we can also start stabilizing the ABCs because splinting can bring the bones back into alignment and that can help with circulation, okay? So, um, do I need to spend time talking about what a splint is? Are you guys familiar with it enough? I mean, I hope so, because we're checking off on Monday on splinting, so I would hope you guys are prepared. But yeah, I'm not gonna go into it, but just know there are all sorts of different kinds of splints. The SAM splint is just an example we show you. It's a common used piece of equipment. Okay, um, but like that yellow bag's got vacuum splints in it. I've used cardboard, I've used pillows, I've used blankets, you know, you've got options. Just make it work for you, whatever you got around you, yeah. Is, something car is cardboard something that you guys would carry for mm -hmm. splinting? Okay. Yeah, so in the, if you look at an ambulance, right, there's the outside cabinets. On the driver's side at A County, on the lower end, if you open that, that's all the splinting. It has like vacuum splints. Um, it has cardboard splints as well, and they're just pieces of cardboard that are corrugated so you can fold them. Um, when's the last time I used one of those? I think it was with Chris. Pretty early in my career, we had a, a, a Hell's Angel crash his motorcycle downtown, and uh, he didn't much like me for whatever reason, but unrelated, <laughs> he, uh, we were like, you wanna go to the hospital, man? And he's like, nah, I'm not gonna go with you. I'll ride in the back with my brother. I was like, okay, you can hop on the back of a motorcycle with a broken leg, that's your prerogative, man. But let me put cardboard on it, at least. And so I, I did that, and he was not a fan, but it's okay. He went in with his brother, it's all that matters. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, is there like a different procedure when uh, a patient has a fracture that has a false movement? Do you just splint that? Can you just splint that? Normally? Just splint it, yeah. Uh, there's no there's no crazy way to do it outside of just being gentle with that floppy portion, right? But it's still going to be splinting it, getting it in place. Uh, nothing really changes outside of the uh, the gross factor. Yeah. Uh, okay. Da, 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 da. So remove clothing from area. Note and record patient's neurovascular status, CMS, PMS. You have to take care of that, right? Before and after we splint before and after we put a collar on, before and after we do anything to manipulate the body, we have to check CMS, PMS, because we do not want to lose circulation. Now, let's say I break a bone. Say I break this bone. What two things need to be secured? The joints above and below, right? Versus say I break this joint, what needs to be secured? The bones above and below, right? So. If it's a bone, joints above and below. If it's a joint, the bones above and below. Those all need to be stabilized. You could also just, you know, mobilize the whole extremity, but that might be a bit extreme depending on what it is. Okay, but regardless, that's going to be the answer. You're going to want to remember that because hint, hint, wink, wink, it might show up. I don't know next week. Also, hint, hint, wink, wink might show up on your national registry because that is a commonly asked question. When splinting a joint injury, what needs to be secured? The bones above and below, or the proximal and distal bones. Okay, I promise you, you're gonna see it to some extent. Okay, so different kind of splints. Rigid splints, made from firm material, so they're gonna be put on the sides, front or back of the injured extremity. This is gonna be um, something a little bit more solid, right? Prevents motion from the injury site, and we have to, it's gonna take at least two people to apply. This tends to be like cardboard, it's gonna take one person holding it, one person taping it, okay? Um, 
So two, two situations in which you must splint the limb in the position of deformity, when the deformity is severe, and when you encounter resistance or extreme uh, pain when applying traction. So the general rule of thumb they teach is that if someone has a fracture and they don't have pulses in there, that they want you to pull some gentle traction to see if you can get bones realigned and get circulation reestablished. Myself, I do not like that idea. Right, because there's just so much going on in there. I don't want to be the one that pinches muscles, destroys vasculature. I tend not to. I would note it, splint it, and just drive faster, personally. Okay, but textbook answer is that if someone has a fracture with loss of pulses, you can put a little bit of traction on there, get that circulation back. It's up to you. Like I said, though, I'd heavily caution you with it. So, because this is a commonly asked question too, when when the deformity is really severe, right? Like their humerus took a 90 degree turn. How are we gonna splint it, right? And a lot of times it's just gonna be position of comfort for them, okay? Try and get something underneath to hold it so they're not, you know, just wagging over here all the time. Um, but deformities can really throw it off. Just do your best, make your splint work around the deformity, okay? We're not trying to ever force anything really back into place. Okay. Uh, formable splints, that's like a SAM splint, right? These are the ones that we commonly use too. So SAM splints are a big one. Uh, air splints, vacuum splints, pillow splints, sling and swath bandages. Uh, technically what I taught you guys with that Israeli is a sling and swath. The sling is what holds the shoulder up and the swath is what secures them to their body. I just like showing you with the Israeli because why not cover two birds with one stone? Right, easy, one piece of equipment. Um, not to burst bubbles, I know I've told some of you this, but with SAM splints, I use those very, very infrequently through my career. Like, I think I can count on one hand how many times I actually used a SAM splint. I would use things like pillows pretty frequently. If it's a broken arm, just put a pillow down in front of them, let them rest it, right? I'm not about, I personally did not want to put people through more unnecessary pain than they had to. So I would tend to do pillow splints a lot. Um, I also would use the vacuum splints quite a bit. And those vacuum splints are nice because they're moldable. And I've, I've even used them on pretty deformed, uh, one femur, uh, gal broke her femur right in the middle. And she was sitting in a dress and she was kind of sitting like a princess. And I was like, something doesn't look right about this. And she's like, I think I broke my leg. And I lifted up her skirt. Sure, she broke that femur in half. And I said, well, ma'am, you broke your leg. And then she called me for telling her she broke her leg when she said it the first time. So there's more to that. She ended up being one of my favorite patients ever, but still, it, I used the vacuum splint on it. All we did is we wrapped it around, vacuumed it, and then we just lifted her up and put her on the gurney. It worked just fine. Okay, you have options. Granted, I gave her pain meds, which people tend to like you better after you do that, but just saying. Uh, pelvic binder. So this is gonna be one of those things. So, well, pelvic binder is used for a broken pelvis, right? If someone breaks their pelvis, we want to get everything back in place. That's the idea of the pelvic binder and making sure we're not going too high. You're gonna be covering that actual hip joint itself. Okay, you're not going over the wings, you're going over the whole hips. And you're just basically cinching them together. That way, if there's any cracks, we're kind of forcing them back tighter. With the pelvis, we tend to be more aggressive with it because you can bleed so much, right? It is a genuine life threat with a broken pelvis, yeah. Does that pelvic binder slow down the pelvis bleeding? Yeah, yeah, all splinting does actually. So if you splint, you can reduce bleeding, which is the kind of the, the reason we do it and patient comfort. But pelvic binders are, um, in my experience, they don't have a ton of, I never had a ton of access to specific pelvic binders, like a piece of equipment that was a pelvic binder. They're starting to roll them out more because when I was trained, they told us basically fold a blanket and then tie it around them. It's gonna take two people and you're gonna cinch them closed. Turns out that's been doing some more damage and actual true pelvic binders work better. So that's working its way in, um, which is good to see. There's also, I learned a different way you can actually make a pelvic binder out of a SAM splint and a tourniquet. You cut two slits on the SAM splint, you wrap it around, you work a tourniquet through there, and then you just cinch that tourniquet tight and it pulls the pelvic or the uh, SAM splint together and pelvic binds them. So you might have to MacGyver a pelvic binder of sorts. 
just depending on your agency, right? We just don't know where you guys are gonna land quite yet. And they might have some pretty cool equipment, okay? So I don't know quite yet. But pelvic binder, in general, used to keep the pelvis solid. So hazards of improperly splinting. We can compress the nerves, tissues, blood vessels, right? We can cut off that circulation. We can delay our transport. We can prioritize a splint over a life threat because it's more visually jarring, right? That's a uh, hazard to splinting. We're wasting time, okay? Um, with compression of nerves, tissues, blood vessels comes reduction of distal circulation. And then the more we mess with it, the more, the more that we are torquing around on a broken extremity, the more aggravated and swollen and angry that injury is gonna get, right? Try to get it done the first time. If it takes multiple attempts, you run the risk of, of causing what we call barrow trauma. Um, I know you guys, I told you guys barrow plates, right? Those are the pressure plates. There's also barrow trauma, which is provided or provider caused trauma. Uh, you see barrow trauma a lot with medics when they intubate people. If it takes three, four attempts to intubate somebody or even doctors and that blade just scraping the roof of their or their throat and their tongue the whole time, you can cause some swelling in there. So. Same thing with, with splinting, we do run the risk of causing trauma ourselves, okay? And then we can injure anything that's deeper as well just by shifting, right? If they've got a shard of broken bone in there and we're just manipulating it, it is just slicing through everything that it's touching, okay? So we can do some more damage. Um, so transport, like I said, very few of them are gonna require speed Okay, if it's a isolated arm, leg, you know, arm or lower leg, I guess I'll say, speed is not the biggest deal. Even if it's one femur, just one broken femur, that tends not to be the biggest deal. It's when we have, you know, two femurs and a pelvis or a pelvis by itself, which even then I've driven those in a lot non-code, okay? Um, read the room, read your patient. Pay attention to them, okay? If they start, their, their vital signs are starting to trend poorly, their, their appearance starts to get worse, okay? That's when we start to think, okay, we need to drive faster. If we see just shock, right? If we see shock signs really starting, that's when we're worried. That's when we drive fast. Outside of that, most of these are gonna be non-emergent transports, okay? Um, and then I'm not gonna get into the flight side because you'll be trained on your flight wherever you end up. So, injuries to the clavicle or scapula, shoulder blade or collarbone, okay? Collarbone is a very commonly broken bone. It's one of those, it breaks a lot when people fall and they reach out like this and then they just have that impact, okay? It's a very, very commonly broken bone, especially in kids, uh, the monkey bars, those bastards. I get them every time, you know? I mean, I'm sure we all know somebody who broke at least one bone on monkey bars once in their life. Okay, if not yourself. A uh, patient will have pain in the shoulder and hold their arm across their body. This is a very common way to self-splint. Remember when we, I was talking about splinting and I told you most of the time patients are gonna self-splint? This is exactly it. If something hurts, they're gonna hold it to them, right? Because they're trying to protect it. So it's gonna be the same thing, collarbone, shoulder blade, and it's definitely gonna have some swelling around the area, okay, depending. So scapula, not as common. Okay. The bone is pretty well protected. You have a large muscle group that covers your scapula. And also that's kind of a weird point of trauma, right? Like kind of in your upper shoulder back area. Okay. Um, if they do break it, it's usually a forceful direct blow. I've only ever, that I know of, had one scapular fracture. It was at a truck depot um, on coal. And it was right after a ice storm. And the guy slipped in the parking lot, landed on his back. And he was pretty uncomfortable and turned out he broke his scapula. Um, now the associated chest injuries pose the greatest threat to long-term disability, right? And it's the same thing. It's when people break bones and they don't get them checked out and they start to fuse weird that they start kind of, well, corrupting, I guess is a good word. They start impacting the other structures around them, right? It's the same reason like someone breaks a leg and they ends up healing in like a bowed fashion. They have one bowed out leg and one's normal, right? That's gonna impact how they walk, which can start having implications on their hips, which can have implications on their back, right? You see how these compound on themselves. It's not just the main injury that we gotta worry about dis, uh, deficit wise. Okay, it's everything associated with that injury. 
and then the AC joint, the acromioclavicular joint, that's a pretty commonly injured uh, area as well. Separated AC joints, dislocated AC joints, pretty common during spoint, uh, spoints, sports. And these fractures are splinted, sling and swath, both of them. Okay, very, very easy. Now, if they have a broken scapula, what I would say is be very careful and cautious when you're using, if you're gonna use that Israeli, that you're not putting a ton of pressure on a broken scapula, right? Make sure we're crossing over on the non-injured extremity when we're wrapping around the back. Okay, shoulder dislocations. Humeral head usually will pop out anteriorly, so their, their shoulder will roll forward a little bit. Okay, as that, that moves out. So very painful, all sorts of demographics. Um, in my experience, dislocations of shoulders can also be tied into fractures. Fractures can pull joints out. Uh, I had a gal who fell, reached out, broke her humerus right here, but when she broke it, it actually dislocated her shoulder as well. So you might have to deal with multiple things, okay? Just keep that in mind. As far as splinting goes, splint them as best you can. Once again, sling and swath, right? If we're thinking shoulder joint, we gotta secure the bones here, and we gotta secure this bone. So we're gonna tie everything together on the chest. Uh, for the humerus, usually it's gonna be a proximal mid shaft or distal fracture, okay? I mean, those three descriptions are the whole bone, essentially. But yeah, you can break anywhere on that bone. You can consider traction. Uh, the humerus, like the femur, is a larger bone. It could handle a little traction. You can always attempt it. I just would say be cautious with it, and you might not have a lot of success. Just keep that in mind. But regardless, our treatment, still the same. Okay, sling and swath. Not a lot changes there. Though I will add with the, the fracture that we can splint that upper, right? We'll splint up here, and then we'll sling and swath. Uh, the elbow, so there's different types of elbow injuries. It can be a fracture, it can be a dislocation. Regardless of the injury type of, or the type of fracture, uh, we are not gonna know. We need to have an x-ray done. That patient needs an x-ray. We're gonna let them go to the doctor, right? That's why we don't reduce things. So fractures of the distal humerus, common in children. Fracture fragments rotate significantly, producing deformity and causing injuries to nearby vessels and nerves. Has anyone ever seen a dislocated elbow before? I didn't show a picture or a video in here. I might show one. They're pretty gnarly. Yeah, that's a good picture. I think that was, that might be the guy I'm thinking. I think that was like 2008 Olympics. But yeah, he was, there's a, he was a power lifter. He went up for like an overhead snatch and out he went. Yep. Typically in athletes with the dislocations and the ulna and radius are most often displaced posteriorly. So usually the, the um, forearm bones will move their way backwards. Okay. Like straight behind the elbow. And then that's kind of what it looks like when it's all said and done. It's uh, pretty jarring. Uh, you can, the olecranon, so the olecranon is actually like this portion of your elbow. It is that bony portion of your elbow. It's kind of an extension of your, uh, uh, your radius, okay? It extends off of it. Direct or indirect pressure, it's usually falls, right? People falling on their elbow and then they break that portion right there. Can have a cut, can have an abrasion over just because that's thin skin. And with that impact, you can split that skin open. Um, pretty, pretty common. And then patient will be unable to extend their elbow. Okay, if they break it, they're not gonna be able to extend it all the way out if they break that olecranon. Because if it's swollen right here, right, as that swelling takes up space, they're not able to actually use that hinge joint. Okay. Uh, fractures of the radial head, often missed during diagnosis, generally as a result of an outstretched arm. That's why like wrestlers, they train wrestlers when they fall to keep their arms in versus keeping their arms out because when people fall backward like this, it's when they break their arms, okay? Um, attempts to rotate the elbow or wrist can cause dis uh, discomfort with these ones, okay? Because our radius is the bone that moves as we rotate our arm, our forearm like this. It's kind of crossing over the ulna. So any attempt to rotate at all, it's gonna cause some radial movement 
and some strong discomfort. As far as our care goes, splint it as best you can, right? If they have the arm in front of them, splint it and then sling and swath, hold them securely. If it's out, that dislocation out, protect that arm, right? Especially as we're rolling them on a gurney because they're not gonna be able to keep their arm in. It's gonna be hanging out. So for the love of God, watch out for door jams because they will find them, okay? You make that mistake one time and you're a bad guy all of a sudden. Um, so protect that arm and then put pillows underneath them. Just get them as comfortable as you possibly can. Um, you're gonna have to MacGyver this situation a little bit. Uh, I wish there was a clear cut answer on what to do every time, but there's not, okay? It's a world of gray. You're gonna have to figure it out per situation because every presentation is a little different. Forearm fractures, all age groups. Elderly and children though are predominant, okay? They have weaker bones. The older you get, they're, they're more brittle. The younger you get, they're just not as strong yet, okay? Usually radius and ulna will break at the same time. If it's a clean transverse fracture, they will break both, okay? And then to stabilize them, SAM splint, padded board, you have options, okay? Pillow, vacuum splint, whatever you wanna do. Okay, you've got choices. Just make sure it's secure, and then like always, before and after splinting, checking circulation motor sensory. Okay, wrist and hand must be confirmed by x-ray. Dislocations are usually with a fracture, okay? Uh, isolated, non-displaced fracture of the carpal bone. So it's not uncommon for people to break their wrist or to fracture just one of the wrist bones, okay? That's a lot of fall type related things too. Same thing we're always doing, splinting them up. Now checking circulation might be a little tough, right? Because we can't find a pulse. So what can we use instead of a pulse to check circulation? What was it? CRT. CRT? Yeah, cap refill. Exactly. Our cap refill time, that's what CRT stands for. Uh, less than two seconds is good. If it's over two seconds for that to return to pink, that circulation is uh, compromised. Okay, and then any questionable wrist injury should be splinted and evaluated in the ED. If you're really unsure about how to splint something, put them on a pillow, get them comfortable, let the ER deal with it, okay? Do your best, but that's not always, not always something we can do, right? We can't always splint everything and there are gonna be moments where you're like, I don't know what to do. When in doubt, make them comfortable, get them to the emergency room, okay? Let the doctors and nurses deal with it. So the pelvis, direct compression in the form of a heavy blow typically. A lot of times it's falls. Um, when I, in my experience with fractures, hip fractures, it's a lot of fall related stuff. I have had some younger, uh, it tends to be women, but I've had a couple of younger women break their hip, but that was pretty heavy mechanism. It was, one was car wreck, one was sports related. And uh, both of them took pretty heavy impact. Okay, they can have life-threatening bleeding, right? One and a half to two liters of our total five to six can be lost through the pelvis. Typically, a pelvis is not a open fracture. Those tend to be closed fractures. And with pelvis injuries, the giveaway tends to be their feet. Um, and I'll show you what I mean in a second. And then with a broken pelvis, if there's any free floating pieces of bone, we run the risk of lacerating and cutting anything any of those structures in there open. Now, what I was saying with their feet, if people break their hip, if it's a genuine pelvic fracture, uh, fracture, their leg tends to be shorter, whatever side that's injured on. And if it's a fracture, it tends to be rotated externally. Like if they're laying there, one foot will be up, one foot will be just flat on the bed, okay? If it's a dislocation, it tends to be shorter in a medial rotation, okay? Because when we rotate, it tends to be more, or excuse me, when we dislocate the hip, it tends to be more posterior. Okay, um, and then I've given this warning to a few different classes. If you are one of those people who put your feet up on the dash while you're driving and you get in a wreck, the bone fragments lacerating those three, that bone fragment's gonna be the whole bone. You're gonna dislocate that femoral head and it's gonna be shooting into you. So don't do that, okay? It's gross. So suspect fracture. If the pelvis is uh, in any patient who has sustained a high velocity injury, pay attention to the mechanisms, okay? If someone's ejected from a car, if someone has two broken femurs, right? That's a lot of force. More than likely their pelvis is gonna be associated, okay? 
Uh, they'll be tender, assess for tenderness, you'll have to feel the area. And then they may have abdominal pain, they may even have uh, blood in their urine if they've had any injuries to their bladder associated with the pelvis fracture. Um, there's a couple of different types. So this is how they want you assessing for them. We learned, the science has taught us that, so when we assess, we just squeeze in, okay? We don't squeeze down anymore, because it was showing that when we were doing that, we were um, causing further damage to the pelvis, and we we're also putting them at risk of open book fractures, which an open book pelvic fracture is essentially when this pubic symphysis here in the middle snaps, so then your pelvis just kind of lays itself open. Okay, and that's another reason we use that pelvic binder. Let's bring everything back together, playing the way it should. So hip dislocations, it says dislocates only after significant injury, depending. If they've had hip dislocations in the past, they're at risk. Um, even if they've had hip replacements, they can be at risk. Um, I've been, there's one gal in Meridian, I saw her two or three times for dislocated hips. She had a hip replacement, she fell and dislocated it once early, they got it popped back into place, and then after that, the next time I saw her, all she did was sit down on a concrete retaining wall in her backyard, popped it right out, okay? Um, it doesn't have to be a major injury, it can also be like a twisting motion, someone's foot gets caught, okay? Um, most dislocations are gonna be posterior, so when that leg dislocates, it gets shorter, and because it's dislocated, it tends to pull it the foot medially, okay? Fractures are lateral, dislocations are medial, okay? Suspected dislocation in any patient who has been in an automobile, automobile crash, has a contusion, laceration, or obvious fracture in the knee region, right? If, we, if the mechanism lines up, gotta be thorough, don't miss things, okay? Palpate everything. Uh, posterior dislocation, so our sciatic nerve, you guys have all heard of it, I'm assuming. My sciatica is acting up, okay? It's that big nerve. It runs from your lower back through your butt down your leg. Uh, there's a channel in your, your glutes where it sits. There's also a little muscle called the piriformis that sits over the top. It's like a band like that thick and just sits over the top. Um, that piriformis can be a real booger. It can cause back problems as well as uh, sciatic-related pain. But... If you have a, a dislocation and that the ball of that femur goes posterior, you run the risk of impacting that sciatic nerve, okay? So it can be pretty painful. And these people are the ones that when you try to move them, they're gonna scream, okay? Unless you can get pain meds on board early, they're gonna scream. So severe pain in the hip, strong resistance to the movement of the joint, and then tenderness on palpation. Um, and then pay, pay attention once again to their feet. So we don't, dislo or we don't reduce any dislocations in the field. As an EMT basic, that is not in your scope. You have no, dislocate or, uh, excuse me, no reduction ability when it comes to dislocations. Okay, so we're splinting it as best we can. When we splint the pelvis, it's more than likely gonna be a pelvic binder of some sort, but just get them as comfortable as you can. And a lot of times too, you can put like pillows under their leg, put pillows under their knees because they're not gonna be able to let um, that pelvis fully relax because the hip is obviously out. So pad up under their leg, make it comfortable for them, and then just get moving. A lot of times a dislocation tends not to be a uh, critical call. These tend to be fairly stable people, okay? But they're gonna be uncomfortable, so just get moving. The sooner you're moving, the better off they're gonna be. Proximal femur, so if we break up near the hip, right, this is gonna be another one where you see that shortened and medial rotation. Okay, older people with osteoporosis break the femoral head quite a bit, or the proximal femur. So break goes through the neck of the femur, or the enterocantric region, which is gonna be where the, uh, the, the ball joint actually is, okay? And then, or it can go across that proximal shaft. So it can actually break all sorts of different ways in that femoral head there, okay? Um, they're gonna have a characteristic deformity, leg internally rotated. Oh, this one has, oh yeah. Leg internally rotated and injured limb is usually shorter than the opposite. That's backwards. 
usually a dislocation is going to be internally rotated and the uh, fractures are externally. But regardless, does it make much of a difference in our treatment plan if it's dislocated or fractured? Not really, right? We're still going to the hospital. Pay attention to the foot, okay? I would still tell you to lean towards lateral side means fracture, but if this is the book answer that they want you to know, remember that. Okay, so assess for pelvis for soft tissue injuries, bandage up appropriately. We're gonna use that pelvic binder once again, CMS, PMS, and then if there is uh, more fractures, if they like have a leg fracture also, let's get them on into the ambulance, let's get the pelvic binder on into the ambulance, and then we can splint the rest of the leg. Okay, that way we're still moving, there's positive forward motion. Mid-shaft femurs. This is when we use the Sager. This is when traction splints. Okay, now it's kind of difficult to discern. That's why I, we honestly haven't gone over it is because the Sager is a very not used piece of equipment, like ever. Every time I've heard someone attempt to use it, it did not work. Reason being is it's very hard for us to tell where exactly a fracture is, right? Because we can't look through the skin. We can't see the bone. And if it's not perfectly in the middle, the Sager doesn't work, okay? Um, but when the mid-shaft femur breaks, the idea with traction is, so if we have two bone ends, right, and then they break and they're like this. Well, when they do this, it shortens the leg up, one, but two, that muscle starts to spasm. And when it spasms, it's just pulling these bone ends into tissue, okay? So that's why we use traction. The idea of traction is to pull the bone ends back to at least level with each other and stop the muscles from contracting because we have a, one of our, well, some of our largest muscles are in our thighs, okay? Help with our, our movement, our quads and our hamstrings. So these are pretty painful as well. Uh, may have a pretty significant deformity. And then there's often blood loss because the femur, you can lose a lot of blood. Same thing with any other broken bones. You can have fragments, excuse me, floating around and those fragments can start to disrupt vessels, nerves, tissues, okay? So if it's open, dry, sterile dressing, and just manage as best you can, okay? Like I said, these are best done with a traction splint, but that's the book answer. Reality is hardly ever are they used for that. More often than not, um, especially for you guys as EMT basics, if you're gonna be running with the medic, that medic is gonna dose them up heavily with narcotics, okay? Um, which tends to make the screaming stop. So traction splints, used primarily for a mid-shaft closed femur fracture. Um, there was a little bit of back and forth about can we use a Sager splint or a traction splint on an open uh, fracture? The, the original answer was always no, but if you kind of think about it, it kind of doesn't make sense as to why no, because at the end of the day, you're still pulling the bone ends together. You're just putting more risk to the tissues, but kind of is what it is, because like I said, not a very used piece of equipment, um, but a, a traction splint will secure the femur. It'll pull those bone ends back into place, securing or stabilizing them. Okay, it aligns the, the leg again. And then if there's any compromise to the nerves or the vasculature in there, it can help, can, I don't know. I've, I've got a very biased opinion about the Sager just because the, the couple of times I did try it, it definitely did not work. Um, and it definitely was not my idea to use them, but they wanted to use them anyway. And it just made the problem worse for me. So I'm not a big fan, but if you, like the idea of a Sager splint and you want to try one when you're out in a call, I'd encourage that. You guys will be trained with all of your equipment when you get into your department. Okay, they'll teach you how to use whatever Sager splint they have. There's a couple of different types. Um, there's what's called a real traction splint and then the Sager, which is, the Sager has got a handle. You put it up in their groin and you just pull it. It's tied to their foot. And as you're pulling it, it starts stretching it back into place. The real one is like those tent poles you put on either side and then you have to pull them down. Uh, the tent pole ones usually take two people to do though. So another reason they're not commonly used there. Um, 
there's one other thing. Oh, and then for another reason that these traction splints are hard to use, justifying using them, is that to use them, you have to ensure there's no pelvis, knee, or ankle involvement. But if someone gets hard enough to fracture their femur, do you think that's good enough force to break their hip also? Right, so we're running the risk of maybe pulling things apart that we shouldn't pull apart. They're a great idea on paper, just don't have enough information in the field. You don't have x-rays to really confirm this is what we should do. Uh, knee ligaments, pretty common, ACL, MCL, LCL, PCL. Those are very commonly injured ligaments. And now that you guys know some med term, you know exactly where they are. ACL stands for anterior cruciate ligament, so it's the front of the knee. PCL stands for posterior cruciate ligament. LCL is lateral, MCL is medial, right? So you know exactly where they are on the knees now. You're learning, see? Um, so different regions, you can also dislocate the patella, like I said, and then bony elements in there can fracture as well if it gets, depending on the injury type, it is possible to rip ligaments off of bones, and it's possible when you do that to rip bone chunks away with it. Um, I know we're talking about knees, but my aunt a few years back fell down. She was treating a patient. She did home health uh, hospice care, and she slipped on some wet water, and she ended up tearing her hamstring off of her pelvis, but she ripped a chunk of her pelvis off with it because they're very, very strong. Okay, so there can be bone involvement with ligament tears and disruption. So with ligament injuries, swelling, maybe some pooling of blood, potential tenderness, joint effusion, meaning their joint feels like it's rubbing. They might have a grinding sensation in there, okay? And then you're gonna splint, like always, splint all suspected knee injuries. Dislocation of the knee. They are pretty graphic as well. So these are true emergencies that are going to threaten the limb. When someone dislocates a knee, it does disrupt circulation. Okay, because our vasculature is not meant to slide, or excuse me, to, um, well, let me rephrase. When you, when you dislocate, you're gonna start kinking off vasculature and you're gonna start rubbing on nerves. They're gonna be really painful and you're gonna disrupt some circulation down to the foot, okay? So the ligaments can be damaged as well. It's not just a dislocated knee, right? Anytime that's moving, you're putting stress, stress and strain on all of those structures in there. So you can have additional tears. Um, and then direction of dislocation refers to the position of the tibia with respect to the femur. So if it's a posterior dislocation, it's gonna be, the tibia is gonna be turned, okay? If it's a medial dislocation, it's gonna be turned, right? It just depends on where that tibia is as to where that knee is gonna dislocate. And it's all based on the mechanism on how it happened. And I will say, I know a couple people who have dislocated their knees and they, it's become a problem for them, okay? Because once again, if you do it once, especially like a dislocation or a sprain, it's very common to do it again. So complications, complications, life-threatening, uh, what is it? Life-threatening popliteal artery disruption. You have a small little artery that runs behind your knee, popliteal or popliteal, however you want to say it. So if you disrupt that, you can have some pretty severe bleeding, okay? You can damage nerves. The joint's gonna be unstable because the things holding it in place are missing, right? So it's kind of sliding in there. Um, and then if you have distal pulses, you're going to attempt to splint. Now, even if you don't have distal pulses, I'd still attempt to splint. You're just gonna be driving faster, okay? Get them to the doctor. Above the knee fractures may occur at the distal end of the femur, at the proximal end of the tibia, or in the patella. Um, it is possible to break all of those things. If there's an adequate distal pulse, no significant deformity, splint the limb with the knee straight. Um, one of my last calls was a kid who wrecked his motorcycle in Meridian and uh, he ended up hitting his knee on a curb and he broke his kneecap just in half, just clean down the middle. And he's probably the toughest dude I've ever seen in my life. Uh, he was a rugby player, fresh off an ACL surgery. He said he was leaving his doctor's office from his ACL surgery, just got cleared, and then broke his, his patella in half. Um, he didn't want pain meds, didn't want transport. He wanted to go with his dad. And he was cool, calm, collected the whole time. It was pretty impressive, actually. So just be aware, you will run into these. Um, if there's an adequate pulse, splint, 
go, if the pulse is absent, call medical control. They're probably going to either guide you on how to get some of that back in, or excuse me, how to realign the injury, okay, and then try and get the uh, circulation back, or they're going to tell you to splint and drive fast. Just depends. But if you don't have pulses, you can always call medical control. And then if it's a knee or ankle, we're never using traction splints. It's only for a mid-shaft femur fracture with nothing else wrong, okay? So very common dislocated kneecaps. Young adults and usually athletics, the last guy that I had dislocated his kneecap was a wrestler. Um, he got his leg caught in a weird position. When his kneecap dislocated though, it kind of did something wonky. Usually when they did, this is the knee and this is the kneecap. Usually when they dislocate laterally, they just slide. His went down and then popped itself back up. So it was like lateral to his knee. When I felt it, I could feel the ridges under his patella. Um, it was a pretty gnarly one. I, we tried reducing it once and then my nightmare of twisting it over started to play into my head too much. So I said, nope, we're done. Let's just get him to a hospital. Um, that guy got a lot of drugs that day from myself and the doctor. He got like Dilaudid, ketamine, Versed. He was living his best life, um, saying some off the wall stuff. I had to tell his mom that none of the things he said count today because of drugs. So splint the knee best you can. You guys are not gonna be um, reducing these. I will say when people have a dislocated patella, their leg stays flat. So typically the closer you can get their butt to their knee, the more comfortable it is for them if you're not gonna reduce it. And then you can always kind of slide them down on the gurney a little bit and bring their butt closer to it just for comfort. But let them guide you. They'll tell you where they wanna sit and how they wanna sit. And if something's uncomfortable, you're gonna find out. Uh, tib fib fractures, you're just gonna splint as best you can. If there's a, a major deformity, maybe use something like a vacuum splint that we can mold around the injury. Okay. Um, outside of that, fairly non-life threatening. If it's straight, you can always splint it with a SAM splint or a rigid splint, but more than likely you're going to use some sort of vacuum splint on these. Okay. Um, they can have some, if there's severe deformity, it says once again, gentle traction. I'm real hesitant on that. My gut says no, but maybe your gut says otherwise. Uh, ankle injuries, most commonly injured joint, okay? People walking like baby deers out there and dislocating all their ankles. Range from simple sprains to severe fractures and dislocations. Okay, and any ankle injury produces pain, swelling, localized tenderness, and they're not gonna be able to bear weight, right? Because that's gonna be the closest portion to the ground. That's gonna be the furthest portion of the body to make contact with the ground for stability. They're gonna be uncomfortable. Um, if there's any wounds, dress them. Outside of that, CMS, splint as best you can. Um, ankle injuries can get pretty gross, at least visually. Has, did anyone ever see, is anyone a basketball fan in here, out of curiosity? Did you see Gordon Hayward's ankle a few years back? Yeah, that's pretty, pretty gnarly. I'll pull up the picture for those of you who haven't seen it. He ends up dislocating and fracturing his ankle. It was, uh, he did a good job, real good job. Uh, Gordon Hayward ankle. And you know it's a dislocation because you can see the socket. That's the socket of his tibia right there. And he's pretty distressed. Yeah, yeah. Less than 10 minutes in. Let's just rip everything in my ankle out. Um, this is what I'm looking for. Okay. We're getting close, everybody, I promise. Okay. Foot injuries can be dislocations, can be fractures, can be all sorts. Okay. One or more of the tarsals, metatarsals, phalanges of the toes. Frequently, though, with broken feet, it's going to be people like jumping out of stuff. They'll break their feet, but then that force is going to move up to their spine, too. So that's the mechanism, right? We've got to look past just the original injury. What can this mechanism really impact? Okay, so if you have a foot dislocation, assess for pulses, motor, sensory, right? Nothing really changes there. Splint as needed. 
there's going to be some swelling. Typically with a foot, there's not a lot of like real deformity to it. It's just swollen. Okay. Um, for me, splinting it, you like, it says rigid board, air splint or pillow splint. I've even had foot fractures where I've just put them on a pillow and they just managed. Put them on their side where they're comfortable. Um, I tend to give patients options. I found that that's usually when people are involved in their own care, it typically helps you out later. So I give them the option. I can either splint this, I can put this on a pillow. Which one sounds better to you? Okay, and then let them guide you. Uh, strains and sprains, rest, ice, compress, elevate. Okay, splint as needed. But sprains and strains, they just need to get their foot up and some ice on them. There's nothing we can really do for it. Um, fun fact, rice was invented by a doctor who was from Harvard, came to find this, the, the professor did his own or the doctor did his own studying, came to find that rice was actually wrong. Uh, rice works really well for uh, management, but it doesn't actually help with healing because when we're talking about ice, ice vasoconstricts. If we vasoconstrict too much, we're not getting blood flow to the area, right? Well, our blood is what circulates the stuff that heals injuries. So if you ice it for too long or you over ice it, you're not getting re-blood supplied um, and it can actually disrupt it. Um, surgeons can, I'm probably gonna skip through a little bit of this one. If it's an amputation, surgeons can reattach it, take them with you. Stop the bleeding, probably a tourniquet, right? If you see an amputation, we're not gonna mess around with pressure. Throw a tourniquet on because there's no no amount of pressure is gonna stop that bleeding, okay? Uh, with a complete amputation, wrap the clean part in sterile dressing, place it in a plastic bag, take it with you, okay? Um, we don't carry ice, we don't carry, we have saline, but we just have bags. So more often than not, you just pop a couple of ice packs, throw it in the bag and throw the leg in there with it and try and keep it cool as best you can. Okay, and then compartment syndrome. So this is, an important, I, I didn't talk about this and I should have when I was introducing splinting to you guys. When we splint, we always, like say we have a broken, we broke our, our uh, radial ulna, right, right in the middle. When we splint, we start at the hand and work our way up when we're wrapping. We never start high and work our way low. Reason being is that we can cause compartment syndrome. Um, think about if you take a rubber band and you put it high on your finger and then you roll that band towards the tip of your finger and the, by the end of it, your fingertip is purple and large, right? Same idea with splinting, except for when we do that and we squeeze all that blood down lower, you can actually cause those muscles to swell. And when those muscles swell too large, they can start impacting uh, vasculature, it can start impacting nerves. So it'll throw their CMS, PMS out of whack and they can get so swollen that they have to do what's called a fasciotomy, which is where they take a scalpel and they cut the skin to allow room for those muscles to start swelling. Um, it's a pretty big deal. They can lose a limb because of compartment syndrome. So when we're splinting, start at the fingertip, work your way towards the body. If we're gonna milk blood one direction, let's go towards the heart instead of towards the end, okay? So most often occurs with fractured tibia and forearm of children, typically develops six to 12 hours after. Excessive bleeding, it could be a crush injury as well, can cause compartment syndrome. Someone drops like a, you know, hundreds of pounds something on their hand or their arm. When they pick that up, it releases a slew of toxins into the blood system. Um, but you guys don't need to know about that because it's a med at the medic level. And then the rapid return of blood to an ischemic limb can cause problems. It's just as, it's as that blood's rushing back into after a crush injury that you can get compartment syndrome. So pain, um, pain on just passive stretching. They may be a little bit pale. They can have less sensation and less power, right? Because the muscles are starting to be impacted and they're starting to influence um, vasculature and nerves. If you suspect compartment syndrome, splint it, keep it at the level of the heart Okay, we don't want it too high, we don't want it too low. Keep it just as best you can at their heart level. That way gravity is not influencing that one way or the other, okay? Because we don't want gravity pulling blood towards the end. And then we don't want it too high because we, we don't want to lose all circulation. Okay, and then reassess PMS, CMS frequently. 
Okay, let's go through the first five and then I just have a couple of talking points and then we'll hit our, our Kahoot. Okay, so skeletal muscle is also referred to as what? Striated muscle, very good. Or uh, what's, the, what's the nervous system that controls our skeletal muscle? You guys remember? Huh? Somatic, yeah. Somatic nervous system controls skeletal muscle, so somatic muscle is also skeletal muscle. You respond to a soccer game for a 16-year-old male with a severe ankle pain. When you deliver him to the hospital, the physician tells you that he suspects a sprain. This means what? See, Charlie? Any disagreements? Good. I agree. Yeah, tearing of lig stretching or tearing of ligaments. That's the, the giveaway, right? The ligament part. A young male has a musculoskeletal injury and is unresponsive. You will not be able to assess what? B. D. Yeah, D. Why not? Because what? Yeah, they're movement stuff. So if he's not conscious, we can't ask him to do something, right? Because he's un unresponsive. Can't tell him to do stuff. Yeah, very good. Okay, the purpose of splinting a fracture is to what? I hear bravo. Bravo. Bra yep, yeah, bravo. Very good. And last one. Motorcyclist crashed his bike and has closed deformities to both his mid-shaft femurs. He is conscious but restless. His skin is cool and clammy, and his radial pulses are rapid and weak. The most appropriate splinting technique for this patient involves what? Hmm? B? D? All right. Well, the answer is none of the above. C, securing him on the long backboard, right? If we put him on that backboard, that flat backboard's gonna hold his legs in place, okay? And then also with traction splints, you can put more than one traction split on. You can put two traction splints on. It's just, once again, if the mechanism's great enough to break both femurs, it's great enough to influence the pelvis and knee as well, okay? So let's...